<laughs> Somebody waved. Okay, so hello. Thank you for joining our session. Um, it's definitely, definitely a different year um, for everyone, but we are super excited that you're joining us to learn about study abroad opportunities. Um, in our region, both Elizabeth and myself are very passionate about this region. Um, I've studied it and lived there on and off. Um, so we're really happy um, to be able to talk to you about this. Uh, my name is Molly Kane, and I represent the School of Russian and Asian Studies. Um, SRAS is how our acronym. And so we are gonna be talking to you about our programs that we have available. I have a video um, that gives kind of um, a snapshot of a lot of our programs, and then we'll, I will go over the program specifics with you after that. And then we can, Elizabeth can talk about it from the study abroad side of things. And then we can go into questions and answers. All right, so let me see. Let's see. SRAS is a team of consultants and advisors dedicated to the rich educational opportunities by locations across Eurasia and beyond. Our course instructors are highly qualified academics and practitioners in the field. Our programs are built around experiential learning, so expect to do a lot of your learning outside the classroom. Our language classes support everyone, from the total beginner to those at an advanced level and heritage speakers. And most subject matter classes are taught in English, so you can study abroad no matter what your language background. We've designed all our curricula with Western credit transfer requirements in mind. SRAS collaborates with our partner institutions abroad to combine rigorous academic experiences with all the other services international students need. Things like help obtaining a visa, local orientation, insurance, 24-hour in-country support, support in the credit transfer process, cultural programs, travel options, and opportunities for internships, volunteering, research, and writing. We like go out and speak to like police and we spoke with the deputy commissioner. She took us to a visit to a prison and we got to like speak with all the prisoners, the guards. So I have never had such a hands-on education for the criminal justice field. In your free time, you're exercising what you learned in the classroom. So it's a good balance of practical knowledge and then exercise the practical knowledge outside. For me, it gave me the opportunity to develop myself professionally and as a student. But I, I feel like I have a perspective that nobody else in my area studied, at least in my university had. I feel like Strats gave me the opportunity to live in the city as well as study in the city. I don't know anybody else who's been on study abroad uh, to Eastern Europe. I should say that, definitely. And they were so excited to share like their lifestyle with us. And it was just a property. Like they grew everything. And we actually danced. We made it like this group of dance and we made a bunch of dolls. And it was just like so much fun. My favorite spot, actually, this is one of my favorite spots. Um, the Trinketo Gallery. Um, it's where they house a lot of a lot of famous Russian paintings. Um, so you'll find like portraits of Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or uh, one of my favorite paintings by uh, Mikhail Nesterov called uh, The Soul. It's 
soul of Russia, roots the soul of the people. And these are the paintings that I kind of like personally kind of grew up with, um, just looking at and just in books. And you, when you just go see it in your real eyes, you know, it's one of those very magical uh, kind of experiences. And these are things that you actually really can't learn from schools. basically building the trail from like the part that it ended so we were out there with pickaxes and like little scissors to weed and um like hose to take the soil out and build a flat trail and kind of continue on from the last point that it was people worked on it I mean, took my breath away when I uh, first saw the the mountain ranges. That's definitely like the first thing that I noticed. Whereas a clear, distinct difference from the United States. So, like, as soon as I stepped foot in Kyrgyzstan, I, I noticed a beautiful skyline and mountain ranges. And on the way to the school, I uh, noticed a cow crossing the street. So and that, that's, that was another big signal that I wasn't uh, I wasn't home anymore. So not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, not in Kansas anymore. There you go. <laughs> so glad that I'm here. I like I love my teacher. Um, I love my friends. I love um, the city. I love my like everything about it. To help finance your study abroad, we also offer funding opportunities for students who research, write, and create visual content for the SRAS family of sites, which cover geopolitics, pop culture, language, and much more. Working on our sites not only helps you build a portfolio and resume, it also complements and deepens your study abroad experience. Study abroad in Eurasia just might be the next step in your education, career, and personal development. Contact SRAS today about the many ways to learn, explore, and build your resume abroad with us. All right. So, can you guys hear me okay? Is everyone able to hear me? Sounds good. All right. So, we're good, right? Yes, and students, when you have questions, you can um, post them in the Q&A or in the chat, and I will be able to answer you in real time. All right, so I don't know about you, Elizabeth, but when I was watching that, it sure makes me homesick because I sure haven't been there, didn't get there this summer. Um, and I love that video because it, I know a lot of those students personally, um, so it's kind of exciting to always watch it. Um, so we are the School of Russian and Asian Studies that I mentioned, and we have three programs that are approved with Ohio State. Uh, we have Russian as a Second Language, which is available in St. Petersburg, um, also in Moscow, and in Irkutsk. And so, um, the different offerings that we have is we have semester-based programs and we also have summer programs. Um, I'm just going to launch into a little bit about each of the schools and the cities and then maybe after that um, you guys could come up with, uh, if you have questions um, in particular, then I can address those. But I'll start in St. Petersburg because that's um, one of our programs that's probably the most popular, um, I think it, for many reasons, I mean, St. Petersburg is such a beautiful city, um, but it's a manageable city versus a Moscow. I mean, it's a little, it has a smaller feel to it. Um, it also has that Western European kind of feel with um, all the beautiful museums and palaces that are there. Um, we work with St. Petersburg State um, and we are literally two blocks away from Nevsky Prospect. So the main street that goes through um, 
St. Petersburg. And if you wanted to walk to the Hermitage, for instance, it might take you 10 minutes. So you can't get any more local, I mean, central than that. Um, the school itself, we have um, dorms that are right there. Um, and so how those work is you have your own room, which is really nice. Um, it's a pretty small space, but you have a bed, you know, have a little study desk, uh, an armoire, and you have your own bathroom, actually. Um, what, how you do with laundry and cooking is there is a communal kitchen on each of the dorm floors. In terms of like security, there are two security um, guards that you have to go through, the first being on the outside of the building. And then once you get in, you have to show, you know, like a propusk, like your um, pass to get through. And then once you get into the building yourself, uh, it's as well, there's another guard. So in terms of security, I know that sometimes that, that comes up, a lot of students um, feel nervous about that. I think we have, we make sure that we keep you guys safe the entire time. And you don't have, there's not a curfew, so you don't have to do that. Uh, come back early in the evening or anything like that. It's just, I wanted you guys to know that there's that safety net that's there. Um, in terms of courses during the semester, students, one trend that I'm seeing more than when, maybe when I used to study abroad is not just Russian as a second language, people are definitely studying Russian, but they're also taking other courses along with that, that is a possibility. Maybe you wanna take a humanities course, a history course, a museum studies course. Um, St. Petersburg State has those classes that you can also take as well. Um, it depends on what uh, term that you're there, but I can give you some examples of some cultural events and activities that we include into our program. Um, if it's in the winter, we might go to Murmansk and we might try and see the Northern Lights. If it's in um, another thing that's very popular that we do in the summer and during the semester is that we have an Imperial Ball and um, you dress up as your favorite czar and learn classical old uh, dances. Um, that is really, 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 I uh, students love that trip. Um, in the summertime, obviously, all the palaces in and around uh, St. Petersburg are just amazing. And so our students spend a lot of time with our uh, guide that we've been working with for a very long time, Sergei, and um, get to go see all the different palaces around St. Petersburg. Always in our programs, if you're in St. Petersburg, there's going to be a Moscow trip included. And same with um, Moscow, you'll get to go to St. Petersburg. Um, so you'll spend a weekend in each of the cities, depending on where you're studying. Um, it will include um, an SRAS, um, uh, you know, staff that will be with you at all times and um, giving you a tour so you're not just left on your own. You'll have a little bit of your own free time too, but um, so you will definitely hit the two, two city, big main cities in Russia. Um, so the second, since I'm mentioning Moscow, I'm going to launch into that. We work with um, Higher School of Economics, and we also have a program at MGMAL, which is the division of Moscow State University, but it's with, um, uh, it is the International Studies. Um, students that are at, from OSU that are studying in the summertime, um, Russian is a second language, that is only at higher school of economics. Um, if you're doing a semester program, students can study at either one of those schools and also take interla international relations, poli-sci courses. Those are taught in English, then you'll study Russian alongside that. Um, the dorm situation is a bit different in Moscow. Um, there's two, well, at MGMO, it's right there. It's walkable distance. Um, at, at Higher School of Economics, it's about um, probably like a 30 minute commute maybe tops. That's with walking from the dorm to the, to the metro and going across uh, the, the river. Um, I did it when I was there last summer just so I could experience it. I know that it sounds like really nice to kind of roll out of bed in St. Petersburg, have your own room and then just go to class upstairs. 
that's great. But I also like it that you, if you're in Moscow, you have to, you have to commute, you have to engage with the city, you have to speak Russian, you have to buy your tickets and things like that. And then you're always looking at like, you know, signs and everything in Russian. So I think there are pluses and uh, there are definitely pluses and minuses to both of those scenarios. Um, the dorms in Moscow are, are shared. Um, again, you'd have a communal kitchen and um, laundry facility um, that's there as well. Um, in terms of food, because that probably can come in, there are not meal plans that are included with us. Um, Russian food has come, I mean, leaps and bounds from where it was when I studied there. It is actually quite amazing. And um, there, are, there are tons of cafes and bakeries and all kinds of things and it's super affordable. And the other thing that probably wouldn't make sense is that, you know, your cafeteria or stolovna, you know, that's on the campus, um, those you can eat a lunch for about maybe two or three dollars and that's a pretty hearty lunch. I mean, that's like a katliati, a kasha, a little salad and and like maybe some kompot, you know, something like that for maybe two, two or three dollars and some black bread. So our students eat at the at the you know the student cafeteria all the time, and it's pretty it's pretty good. Um, and the last place that uh, OSU has recently added to the um, options with us is in Irkuts. Um, I always say don't default to you know barren wasteland prisons. Um, you know, just that's kind of what everybody thinks about when they think about Siberia. But in fact, it's quite a remarkable place. Um, and you could see in the video um, in the summertime, you know, our students spend a lot of time at Lake Baikal. Uh, there's service learning projects that can be done. We also do some research with the lake. So for our biology majors or um, anybody that might be studying zoology or um, they would like to um, work with the Irkut State University there and we can help set up some research opportunities for students. You can also, um, there are two options in terms of housing in Irkuts. You can do live in the dorms, but in Irkuts you have the option to do a homestay. And so you can live with a family um, and that includes two meals. So that would probably, it's usually your breakfast and your lunch and then your dinner usually is on your own. So, um, you know, Lake Baikal is just, it's so pretty and, you know, it's the largest lake in the whole world and to be able to spend time there is, um, is really amazing. The other thing I love to talk about Irkuts is that, you know, you guys are from the Midwest. I live in Austin, Texas. I, I'm not, I am the South, but I consider us Southern hospitality, Midwest ha hospitality. That's what Irkuts feels like. It has that very laid back and um, people are very approachable. Um, it's not to say that they're not in Moscow and St. Petersburg, they're just big, bigger, busier cities. So that's one of the pluses. Um, I think that's really great with going and doing something a little bit different. Plus, you know, when somebody's looking at your CV or your resume and sees that you, great. I mean, first of all, you going to Russia alone is going to make you stand out than going to do to Florence or Barcelona. But, you know, when they see the Irkuts, they're not even maybe they don't even know where that is. So that's always a attention grabber in terms of um, diversity and doing something a little bit off the beaten path. Um, in terms of um, scholarship opportunities, um, you can, let's see, let's see if I can, there are, um, there are so many different um, opportunities that we have for our students. Um, I didn't go to the right page. I can't, I can't multitask. I, I should be able to do this, but I'm not. I want to stay on with me talking. So what we do is we have a series of different kind of um, scholarships that we offer to you. I usually say students that are studying Russian um, tend to be a little bit more scholastic. So if you have a 3.0, you tick the box, you get $500. I mean, for just ticking a box. And that's half your plane ticket. And people will say, well, that's only 500. 
again, half your plane ticket, and then you can keep applying for other scholarships. We've got diversity need, we've got merit. Um, what we do is we have challenge grants, and what those are is we will um, give you um, a scholarship for your tuition, for your program with us, and in turn, you do writing for us. Um, we have a family of sites, and um, it has everything from geopolitics um, to pop culture. Um, so I always try and tell the students, don't think that I'm just gonna sit there and make you um, talk about the US relations between Trump and Putin. Um, we've got cat cafe, you know, culture in Moscow or coffee cafe, coffee culture in St. Petersburg. There's everything. So I encourage you guys, if you're looking at doing a program to go to our family of sites, um, read some of those student articles because I think it really helps having a student perspective on things. Um, and clearly, if you have financial aid, uh, you can use your financial aid towards your study abroad um, experience during the semester. I'm sure Elizabeth will get more into the, um, the, the university side of things, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew um, that there are scholarship art opportunities with us and um, that we also list other opportunities. So there's, you know, you're studying a critical language. Um, so there's CLAs, there's Boren, there's Fulbrights, there's all kinds of different funding um, that are available. And if you see on our sites here, that was what I was talking about, the family of sites, that's all the articles and then the funding. So I'd spend some time um, looking at the funding. Every single student says they can't study abroad because they don't have money. And I'm not saying every single student, but most of the students won't even apply for the scholarship. And at the end of every semester, we have money still to give away. And I don't know why that is. Maybe they think that they won't get it. I say this in every presentation, apply, apply, apply. Just go for it. Um, trying to think of anything else. I think I'm gonna stop there and then let Elizabeth um, talk about the OSU side of things, and then we can get into question and answers. Sure thing. All right, thanks, Molly. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm back. And um, the OSU side of things is, I hope, relatively straightforward. So what that means is um, you are going to apply to both, right? So you're going to submit an OSU application and an application to SRAS. You will do it through our individual websites. Um, Molly, since you're still uh, sharing the screen, would you mind on one of your um, tabs taking us to educationabroad.osu.edu? Um, that's the site that we have, um, and that's where you would find our application, um, and, as well as many other things. Um, and the, I think that should do it. Oh, the second one. Oh, my bad. That's our new website, though. Well. I put Molly on the spot, but as we head to, uh, there it is, there we are. Um, so this is the website that you would come to to submit the OSU application. And of course, the website that we were just on at SRAS is where you would submit theirs. Um, and we ask that you submit both applications by our deadline. So for those summer programs in St. Petersburg and Moscow, um, that would be a February 1st deadline for both. And then for Irkutsk, you could look at the summer, um, which would be February 1st, or for next fall, which would be a March 1st deadline. Um, this kind of takes me directly into the COVID conversation. Um, you can, I guess, apply for spring semester for Irkutsk. Uh, it seems to me that our application deadline for that is going to be October 1st. Um, and again, you are meeting our deadline rather than SRAS's, which is probably a smidge later than that. Um, and 
when you start an application for spring, you're going to get an automated email from our system that just sort of lets you know that we are monitoring the situation, right? We are aware that there is a global pandemic. It's in all the papers. Um, but we don't yet know if the university, and this is really the upper, upper echelons of the administration, will ultimately make a decision about international travel for Ohio State faculty, staff, and students. And the rough timeline that we have here is early October. That's when we expect to hear whether or not spring semester travel is approved. Um, so we don't yet know, um, but we are gonna warily, cautiously move forward um, just in the hopes that spring will be offered here. Um, so Molly has pulled up actually our Russian programs and you see those three SRAS programs there at the bottom. Um, and as noted, we have those Moscow and St. Petersburg options, which are in the summer. Um, it seems to me, Molly, help me out here, because it seems to me that we offer eight weeks in both locations, but is it St. Petersburg where we also have the 10 week option or is that, a, okay. Um, no, so Moscow is at Higher School of Economics. That's the eight week one. I was with okay. a lot of your students last summer. And okay. then the um, St. Petersburg is the 10 week. That is okay. correct. Okay. And I just, I just wanted to jump in really quickly. Sure. Um, I just want you guys, I agree with what Elizabeth is saying, and I don't want to, um, I'm not very hopeful about spring, and that's not probably what I should be saying, but, um, you know, I just want to be realistic as well, and we're getting very nervous, Renee and I, not because of, you know, worries of COVID in Russia and anything like that, or, you know, the Putin um, vaccination, those are not our concerns. Our concerns are that nobody wants Americans in their country. And so we are really feeling like, um, well, we just don't know. I just wanted you to be honest with where we're at with it. And so I think if you guys Clearly, you could have a plan for a spring, but I would highly suggest that you really look at the summer. And I do feel hopeful of the summer. I know that's contingent on how this fall goes, but I mean, at some point we have to move on with life. <laughs> yeah, so. and that's something that's been coming up in my other information sessions today, which is really just talking about the fact that um, the first hurdle is what OSU says. The second hurdle is what any of our partner institutions or our host countries are saying, um, because I know that some of our um, some of our partners are, are not forecasting um, an ability to open spring. So that's going to really color what our options are. And then, of course, as Molly was saying, um, there are a number of countries that are simply um, not allowing Americans in or have lengthy quarantine times. And that's something else that comes in that automated email that you would receive if you started an application is sort of um, putting that on your radar as well that, you know, there are other entry requirements that we should perhaps consider. Um, so that's, that is the two applications, at least what we know right now about COVID. Um, at this point, if you have questions, um, I think we would both be very happy to field them. Um, you can post them through the chat function or through um, Q&A. And I'm gonna take a peek because it looks like we have something. Okay, so we had somebody who had to duck out a little bit early. Um, and then are there any questions that I can field through Q&A. Or better yet, um, questions that you can pose to Molly. Okay. Oh, okay. If we have relatives in Moscow and we go to study there, can we stay with family or are we required to live in the dorms? 
Um, I think that that would be, you know, I'm going to jump in and preempt Molly, who may have a different answer. Um, the first thing that we would want you to do is to run that by our international travel policy committee. Um, this is a, a sort of a multidisciplinary committee made up of um, upper administration at Ohio State. They tend to review these sorts of requests um, to live in non-provider sponsored housing. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn and say, sure, everything is possible. Um, but I do at least want to let you know that there is, I think, a, an appeal or a request process for that. Um, and, and we would then see what SRAS says. Is that even a possibility? Yeah, we don't require our students to stay okay. in our housing so at any of our locations, um, okay. but we default to the home institution on their policy. So we would look to you for that answer. Sure. No, that's great to know. Um, yeah. So that that would be, um, I guess, more on us than it would be on SRAS, but it is a question that we could absolutely explore um, should you pursue that option. And that comes up all the time. Um, Amira, I think she was the one that asked that. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of heritage students that are um, learning Russian, that, you know, but then they want to go and be with their relatives and practice, actually. So that we do have a lot of heritage speakers mm -hmm. join us as well. OK. Other questions? Okay. All right, Molly, is there anything else you would want us to know, um, either as far as how things are looking over the next couple months or, oh, great, you need to put your contact yeah. information, um, anything, you know, the most commonly asked questions that you're getting? Yes, hold on just, um, please. I can see. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to think about what the most common questions are. Oh, I know one that is always comes up that's very important. Uh, what level of Russian should I be at? Um, you could never have Russian, never taken it. We have students that come there that are starting from day, you know, from scratch. What we do is once you arrive, you'll take an exam and then what we do is we'll put the students in different groups what we'll do is after about a week or 10 days we'll assess how are you doing in the class is it too easy is it too hard and we'll move you up and we'll move you down for example elizabeth we had two osu students that we moved up one we moved up and um i think both of them actually got moved up they did you know, because when you walk into the country, you know, first of all, it's the first time you're hitting Russia for the first time. You're completely, you know, it's it's culture shock. You're um, jet lagged. And then here you are taking a, you know, a Russian test. And as we all know, Russian cases are so fun. And that's what it's looking at. So, um, you know, we know that you're going to maybe not either test really well or not test well so we will constantly be looking at that and what i would say about that is all the students that i feel like didn't bump themselves up and kind of stayed in their comfort zone while they were abroad they really didn't walk away speaking that much better push yourself go to the harder level because no matter what you're gonna do you're gonna walk away with more Mm -hmm. um, and I know this because I still take Russian classes and I kicked for in you. I kicked in screen this summer. I took a uh, film course and it was 100% in Russian. And I was like, I don't know these words. And, blah, blah, blah. and it was pretty amazing. So um, we really don't worry about it. That's my number one thing if you don't have a lot behind you. And then if you do, then just continue to work hard and but we will work with you. Sure. Um, a lot I'm of, gonna just, uh, oh, uh, yeah. just very quickly to say that it seems to me that at Ohio State, there is a strong preference for students that have had four semesters of Russian. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that Dr. Stepanova is quite willing to entertain one or two semesters for Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, I think for Irkutsk, they are reasonably, um, I guess the, there is a stronger preference for that um, foundational Russian before going out to Siberia, but certainly for um, Moscow and Peter, um, one or two semesters is a petitionable amount. Um, but I don't know that we would send anyone without any, any Russian. I think we usually like to do at least a semester or two. Yeah, I would think that that would probably be preferable, but we do have the blue. Yes, the, yes, the blue SRS blue. can do all the things. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of students ask about traveling. Um, that's another question. Can I travel while I'm there? Um, you, it depends on which countries we're talking about um, and, and visas. Um, it can get a little bit tricky. Um, so we would just need to understand what countries you were looking at, at traveling with. If you were like, like thinking about leaving Russia while you were studying abroad, or what we usually suggest to our students is let you travel before or you travel at the end, and then you just don't mess with the visa. Um, the rest, Russian visa is tricky, um, and that's why you guys don't have to worry about it. That's what we do for you. <laughs> we deal with the Russian visas for you. So we take care of all that. We'll give you step-by-step -step of how to fill it out and then what to do. And then we, we work with the consulate on that. Great. Um, okay, so I think your contact information is there. I'm gonna go ahead and put my contact information in there. Um, and the reason for that is I, of course, am the one here on campus um, uh, and can field questions. I can also do virtual meetings um, either during our regular you know, office hours or this is now how we're doing our, um, what used to be our drop-in hours are now also by appointment. Um, on Wednesday afternoons. So if you would like to follow up with me either by email or um, by scheduling an appointment, you can do it through that website, which I will add in again here. Um, but I do wanna make sure that you know how to find me and Molly's information is also on here. I know that Molly is also very excited about following up with you. Um, if you have additional questions or wanna know more about any of these programs, um, so do please let us know and really unless I see any other additional questions pop up I'm going to probably end the recording at the very least. Um, anything else you'd like to say for the recording Molly? Come join us. We yeah, love right. you <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay.